Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm council member Thomas Small, and I'm actually getting used to it and liking it. <laughs> um, but uh, I've been asked to introduce uh, Chief White and his team tonight. Uh, this, this presentation tonight is part of a series that we started a while back in, in relation to our general plan to sort of introduce the ideas that are behind the general plan, that go into the general plan. Um, and this is kind of a, a, a special uh, event as part of that series. It sort of it, it began as the prelude to the series to the general plan, but now it's kind of become the uh, a general Culver City speaker series. But uh, in regard to the general plan, we realized at one point that uh, you know, resilience and emergency preparedness and the reaction to potential uh, emergencies that we may have in the future is really a very key part of that. And we realized that we had a terrific expert right at home in Chief White who can tell us exactly how that's going to work as part of the general plan of the future. Um, so he uh, is joining our, you know, this illustrious series of folks that we have brought from around the region and even farther away to talk to us uh, as experts in their field. Um, and I think in, in many ways, as we can see from this large crowd that's here tonight, this is one of the most interesting of the series. So I'm, I'm really delighted to, to thank Ashley Hefner and her team who have put this together and uh, Saul Blumenfeld, who's in, in charge of the department that's supervising our general plan update, um, that that we uh, that you know many of us recognize as perhaps the most important thing that we'll be doing in the city. It's really the blueprint for our future, the foundation of our future as a city. Um, so I'm very very happy to introduce uh, Chief Dave White to talk to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. All right. Well, welcome. Um, also joining us tonight is um, Vice Mayor Mr. Erickson. Thank you for joining us. We have Linda Cunningham from Golden State Water Company here. Welcome, Linda. So, Mr. Small, thank you for that introduction. I'm very, very pleased to be here. I always welcome the opportunity to talk and meet with uh, the public. I have three goals tonight. Goal number one is to focus on the main topic of this series, which is disaster preparedness and what you can do to be better prepared for a disaster. That's primary and why we're here. But secondly, we're going to talk a little bit about your fire department and how we manage the day-to-day -day disasters that we handle. Did you know we do almost 7,000 emergency incidents a year? That's a lot. Okay. And the third reason, so we're going to talk, the other goal, the second goal was we're going to talk a little bit about the fire department so you under, understand how it's organized. And the third goal is it's an opportunity for us to meet you so you know who your leadership team of the fire department is. And that's a good segue to introduce my panel. So you already know me. Christine Parra is our Emergency Preparedness Coordinator. Um, Ken Powell is the Assistant Chief in Charge of Operations. And Jeremy DeBee is our Fire Marshal. So there's the brain trust. Oh. And our uh, mayor just walked in. Thank you. So, onward. So the fire department's mission, you probably already know, is to protect life, property, and the environment. The fire department, your fire department, has core values that we strive to embody and conduct ourselves. Uh, professionalism. Compassion, respect, trust, and humility are very important to us as we provide service to you and as we conduct, our ser as we conduct ourselves and our culture. These are important values. And we have a motto, which is basically to take action for others. I want to encourage you to follow us. And, um, and we're going to talk more about messaging a little bit later. 
but we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, the fire department website is right there, and the website is filled with a lot of neat stuff. There's pages about emergency preparedness, and if you didn't see the handouts in the back, I would encourage you to go take some handouts. There's also some great information on the website, and one of the things on the website is our five-year strategic plan, which is published a couple months ago. Uh, Culver City Fire Department is designated as a Class One Fire Department by the Insurance Service Office. A class one is the highest designation possible, and what it means is, is that Culver City residents and businesses have access to the lowest insurance rates. There's only 305 class one departments in the United States out of about 40,000 fire departments. And another distinction is that we're accredited. Uh, accreditation is a very rigorous process it keeps us focused on continuous improvement and transparency, both which are very, very important for a fire department. We've been accredited since 1998. So it's, it's, it's important and um, uh, as far as continuous improvement and transparency goes, you can't beat it. It's a lot of work though, let me tell you. <laughs> We're in the middle of it right now. <laughs> Ugh. Um, your fire department was established in 1922, so we're almost 100 years old. Some old pictures of your fire department. Another good picture. Our apparatus don't look like that anymore. <laughs> and it's a good segue. I'm going to turn this over to Ken Powell, who's going to talk about our operations a bit. Regular fire department operations. Just a couple minutes on that. Thank you, Chief White. Again, uh, my name is Ken Powell. I am the Assistant Fire Chief, and I'm going to give an overview of the fire department operations. Um, Culver City has three fire stations, and they're strategically located to distribute resources evenly throughout the city. Fire Station 1, if you don't know, is located in downtown Culver City, 9600 Culver Boulevard. Station 1 houses one fire engine, one paramedic rescue, and one command vehicle. Station uh, fire station number two is located at the west end of Culver City, and it's located at 11252 Washington Boulevard. This fire station houses one fire engine and one EMT ambulance. And our final station. Fire station number three, is that better? <laughs> is located up in Fox Hills. Uh, 6030 Bristol Parkway. This fire station houses our ladder truck, uh, one fire engine, and one paramedic rescue. Uh, fire department staffing. We have a total of 61 sworn firefighters. Um, 54 of those firefighters are assigned to fire station duties. Uh, the remaining firefighters are assigned to administrative duties. We have 18 firefighters per day, minimum, in addition to two non-firefighter EMTs who work on our EMT ambulance. We have 11 support personnel and they work in fire administration, our telecommunications division, and in community rest reduction division. Now I'm gonna go through some of the resources we have available to respond in emergencies. This apparatus is our fairly new 2017 Pierce ladder truck. Is a, it has a 100-foot aerial ladder. It also has an assortment of different sized ground ladders. And this vehicle carries a lot of specialized equipment. Equipment for high, low angle rescue, swift water rescue, vehicle extrication, and forcible entry. This vehicle is stationed, like I said, at Fire Station 3. It's staffed with one captain, one engineer, and two firefighter paramedics and or firefighters. This next apparatus is uh, one of our fire pumpers, fire engines. We recently just took delivery of three new engines. This is one of them. It's a 2019 Pierce Arrow. These aren't in service as of yet, but they're estimated to be in service at the beginning of June. And the main function of this apparatus is to put water on the fire. So these pumpers or engines have a pump. They carry various ranges, sizes, and diameters of hose. They have a 500-gallon water tank. 
and are able to get water received from fire hydrants. And we have one of these at each of the stations. This is our command vehicle, and it's stationed at Fire Station 1. It's staffed by a battalion chief, and its main purpose is a mobile command unit. So it is designed, the rear of the vehicle is designed to have mobility to set up a command post at any location. So it's got radios, it's got a desk, it's got lights, it's got references, a computer, all this is in the back. So you could take this vehicle anywhere and set up a mobile command post to run major incidents. These are our paramedic rescues. We have two of them in service. One is at station one, one is at station three. Uh, they provide advanced life support service and they are staffed by two firefighter paramedics. And then our final vehicle is our EMT ambulance. This is stationed at Fire Station 2, staffed by two non-firefighter EMTs, and it provides basic life support services. Emergency services, what are we capable of responding to and mitigating? So fire suppression type calls, structure fires, and this includes residential fires and commercial fires, wildland fires, which is brush and trees and whatnot in un, uh, undeveloped, underdeveloped areas. For example, we've got the Baldwin Overlook. Um, we also respond to wildfires, excuse me, wildfires out of the city. And I'm gonna get in a little more detail on that a little later. Uh, we respond to vehicle fires, road fires, and anything basically that's burning we'll respond to. We provide medical, emergency medical services. Uh, we provide both basic life support and advanced life support services. All of our sworn personnel are emergency medical technicians, and 75% of them are certified as paramedic. We also respond on technical rescue type calls. So vehicle extrication, that would include a, a traffic collision where somebody's entrapped in the car. We have the training, the equipment to actually cut people out of the vehicles using the jaws of life. Uh, we respond on swift water incidents, for example, the Bologna Creek. We've all seen when we have heavy rain how high and fast that flows. If someone were to fall in there, we are able to respond to that and set up a rescue effort. Confined space rescue, this would be, for example, a collapsed roof in a building or a floor gives out in a multi-story building. And then low and high angle rescue, that's anything above or below ground level, which requires special technique and equipment. And we respond to hazardous materials incidents. So illegal dumping of hazardous materials, um, carbon monoxide monitors that you may have in your home. We have the ability to monitor air in your home if we respond and help find a, the uh, location of any incident in your residence. Gas leaks, this would be natural gas leaks inside and outside of a structure. And then vehicle TCs, which are traffic collisions with hazmats involved. So for example, 405 freeway. We know how crowded that can get on a daily basis. Well, it runs through Culver City. So there are very many different types of materials that are traveling through the city on the 405 freeway. We've all seen tanker trucks with fuel, corrosives. These are all solid, liquid type, and the gas types of hazardous materials. So if we have a traffic collision on the freeway, it's not just dealing with the traffic collision, it's what's on that vehicle as well. So mutual aid, um, I touched a little bit upon us responding on wildland fires in the city. We also respond to wildland fires out of the city. And I'm gonna go ahead and read this because it, it's pretty clear and it explains it and then I'll get into it a little bit deeper. Culver City Fire Department is a, <coughs> is a participant in the statewide master mutual aid agreement. This means that the Culver City resources could be requested to assist in incidents outside of Culver City, such as massive wildfires which occur often in California. As part of this mutual aid agreement, the Culver City Fire Department can also request resources from other agencies to help mitigate incidents within the city which require resources above and beyond what we have available. And typically, when we respond outside of Culver City, we respond in what they call a strike team. So basically a strike team consists of a command vehicle with a, a chief and five fire engines with four personnel per engine. Um, 
due to the size of our city, we respond, the strike team is consistent of not only Culver City Resources, but Santa Monica Fire Department and Beverly Hills Fire Department. So the three, inch, three agencies combined bring the resources together to develop a strike team. We've been designated as strike team XLA 1075A. Uh, that's permanent. That is how we are recognized in the system. So whenever there, for example, you know, at the end of summer and early fall when we have these Santa Ana conditions and these giant fires in Northern California or wherever uh, occur, if they need resources because they are unable to handle it on their own, they can pull resources throughout the state. And this is how we would respond as a strike team. On the same note, if we had a major incident in Culver City, we could also request resources to come in and help us here. So it's kind of give and take. Just some quick stats and facts. In uh, 2018, uh, we had 6,791 incidents. 70% of those incidents were medical emergencies. We transported 3,469 patients to local area hospitals. And we had a total of 117 fires. And again, we provide and receive mutual aid via the California Mutual Aid Agreement that's been established. At this time, I would like to, is it? I'd like to introduce Christine Para. She's our emergency preparedness coordinator, and she's gonna come up and talk to you about city preparations. Hi there, everyone. So, I might have to lower this a little bit. Okay. Um, so, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, I'm sure a lot of you that have heard me already, you know, I'm always drilling home about the importance of you being prepared and being disaster resilient. But sometimes we get to talk about what do we do as a city in order to prepare or when to something does happen in terms of our, our plans and our training. So today, I'm gonna just kind of walk you through really quickly um, what happens when disaster strikes? What do we do at the city level? And this is gonna be kind of like a brief overview, but let's say a 7.4 earthquake strikes Culver City. Okay, well, it doesn't happen, but so what, what is the procedures that we take? So first and foremost, we take cover, right? Stop, drop, take cover, hold on. Wait for the shaking to stop. We make sure that everyone is okay, and then we follow our, the, our internal procedures in assessing the condition of our fire stations, our apparatus, which are all our engines, um, and rescues, and then we communicate that information to the on-duty battalion chief which would be, so we have three fire stations, so each fire station would conduct their internal assessment and then would respond and give that information to the on-duty battalion chief. And then from there, every single station has um, a map of the areas throughout the city that they have to canvas and drive to find out situational awareness, basically what parts of the city has been hardest hit and so forth, and then they communicate that information to us. Um, at that point also, we have internal and external communications that are made to begin to support um, the, the incident and begin to recover. Um, our emergency operations plan and our emergency operations center will be activated. So what is an emergency operation plan? And so essentially it's our guiding document, document on how we conduct ourselves in a disaster. It outlines all the potential threats to the city of Culver City. It talks about the actions that, we, that can be taken and it includes job aids for staff that are assigned to our emergency operations center. It's a big document as you can see, but you are more than welcome to take a look at it on our city website. It's there for you to read and has all that information in it. Our emergency operations center is a confidential centralized location where highly trained city staff work to coordinate incident information, manage resources, and support first responders. So this is basically what it looks like. And I like to liken it to whenever you, you, know, you see those movies where there's the TVs and there's the people on the phones and there's maps laid out and everybody's trying to discuss, you know, what's the best way to support or to assist whatever's going out in the field. That's what this room is. And that's what it looks like when there's nobody in it. This is what it looks like when it's to capacity. So clearly, this is an exercise. So this is our staff that are 
conducting an exercise in the emergency operations center. As you can see, everybody is clearly identified, and we follow, which the next slide will show, but we follow incident command system, which essentially is the same system that our police and fire counterparts uh, follow, so that way there's a standardization of information how we communicate. Um, another really important fact that I'm not sure if you're aware, but every single city employee is what's called a disaster service worker. So when we are hired, we take an oath to protect or basically help our city recover um, when disaster occurs. We make sure that our families are okay, and then we report or follow any internal procedures to come to the city and to help support an incident. Um, so this is an emergency operation center FAQ. It's modeled, like I said, after the incident command system, both used by police and fire. It allows for a standardization of processes and terminology. And in the event of a statewide emergency, our, our uh, well, in, yeah, it's a statewide emergency, in the city of Culver City, we'll look to our city for resources first. And if we're unable to obtain resources within our city, then we'll go to the county level and say, can and ask for those resources at the county level. If the county is unable to provide those resources to us, then they will go to the state level, level and then so on to the federal government. So there's an intricate system in place on how to obtain those resources. Um, the, most cases, this EOC stays activated until the incident has been resolved and often will into um, the recovery while the city rebuilds. It also acts as the conduit to local and state officials to help to coordinate aid and support as well. Um, Chief White is going to talk to you a little bit about our volunteer groups that assist us during the disaster. Christine's very humble. The emergency operations plan that she referenced, well, she's the one that put that together, which is a huge amount of work, and uh, submits that to the state. That's a mandatory document for a city or a county. And we, and we submitted that to the Office of Emergency Services of the state, and they liked it so much they used it as a template to show other agencies how it's done. That's Christine. <laughs> So it's a good time. I'm going to keep jumping up in between the other speakers because I want to hit topics that are really important. So that's why I got up again. So let's talk about our volunteer groups. Um, first of all, a CERT. How many CERT people in here? Awesome. Welcome, CERT. For those that you don't, who don't know what uh, CERT is, it's a community emergency response team. Um, started in November of 97. The purpose is to provide training to individuals uh, to promote individual, family, and neighborhood resilience. That's the purpose of CERT. You learn skills related to fire suppression, search and rescue, medical ops, how to organize and work as a team. Um, CERT and our other volunteer group we're going to talk about are, include, are included in the emergency operations plan. There are plans for our volunteers in the event of a disaster. And uh, CERT members also assist in non-emergency situations. Um, most recently, as, as an example, and tragically, we had CERT volunteers assist the police department as they scoured a um, dump site for the body of a six-month-old. You might have read about it in the paper. So there's non-emergency work that CERT does as well. Some pictures of them at our training tower on Jefferson. Just some examples. These are kind of old pictures, but medical ops. Our other volunteer group is Sea Cares, and they're intermixed. They're um, local residents who have obtained an FCC amateur radio license, and their mission is to provide communication in case there's an emergency that knocks out cell phones and telephones and stuff like that. We'll still we have one. We have, we can use these amateur radios to help communicate. They work very, very closely with CERT, and many CARE members are also CERT <coughs> members, and they also work very, very closely with your fire department. CCARES.net. And back to CERT, CulverCityCERT.org, if you're interested in those two organizations. CCARES pictures in the orange. And that's it for our volunteers. Let's turn this over to our fire marshal, Jeremy DeBee. Thank, 
Thank you, Chief White. Uh, tonight I'll be talking to you a little bit about our very high fire hazard severity zone. I'll try saying that fast five times. Uh, my name's Jeremy Debee. I'm the fire marshal here. So Cal Fire designated uh, very high fire severity zone. If you look at this map, Culver City is shaded in gray and in red is that very high fire severity zone. So it's kind of on the edge. And who designates that? Uh, Cal Fire. The state of California? So residences in uh, Blair Hills are located in a moderate slash high severity zone and Culver Crest residences are in a very high fire severity zone. So up close, you could see how it kind of overlaps into the neighborhood here. Uh, something to keep in mind, if you're anywhere on the fringe of this or in high winds, embers could blow up to a mile. So just because you're not covered in red doesn't mean that uh, you don't have to listen right now and or, and or prepare yourself for your home. So pay close attention, please. So kind of a quick overview for a wildland fire action plan. Uh, we talk about ready, set, go. And I'll talk about, um, I'll highlight things that are specific and different for us in Culver City when we look at this. Uh, we're a little different than other places in the state where they might have a wildfire burning and depending on terrain or when, they might have more time. Uh, if it happens to us, we're not going to have as much time. So get ready, uh, dispose of or relocate combustible material from around your home, trim trees and bushes, allowing ample space between your home and the vegetation, uh, be prepared, arrange your go kit with prescription medication, emergency supplies, important documents, and other essential items. Uh, Christine will talk a little bit about some kits. Um, for this one, the documents is a big thing if uh, you want to have those ready to go um, so you can uh, keep anything uh, important to you if the worst does happen. You're going to create your own action plan, involve your family and practice exit plans from the home and neighborhood frequently. and uh, be, be sure you're familiar with local emergency notification systems and evacuation systems. And Christine will talk more about that in a little bit. And you're going to go, act early, get your go kit, and leave well before the threat approaches, uh, following a planned access, accessible route. Um, stay aware of the situation, follow your plan, and uh, cooperate with local authorities during evacuation and reentry. So let's talk a little bit more about those. The main ones um, that are kind of specific to us when we talk about ready is you want to plan and practice your evacuation routes. So you know your neighborhoods. You want um, two ways out if possible, kind of like getting out of your house, um, so that you can avoid the fire if you are trying to drive out of your neighborhood. You want to designate an emergency meeting location outside the fire hazard zone. Um, and lastly, what you want to start doing right now, it's most important, is you want to create defensible space at your home. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. So now that, again, I'm going to point out some specifics. Um, you can read in detail in this handout, but I'm going to talk about stuff that kind of pertains a little bit more to us. So as we enter fire season, which it's kind of year round now, and we're anticipating a, a possibly a very bad fire season because we've had all this rain. So we've got all this growth now, and now all this growth is going to dry out. So it, it's, it's going to be real important this season to pay close attention. So you're going to want to monitor fire weather conditions. Um, for us, the difference here, we don't really monitor fire status because if you're in any of those high fire severity zones and there's a fire, you're going to be getting out. So. Um, we're just too close and it, it, it could all happen too fast. So when you see that on the news, we're looking for those wind events, for those red flag warnings. That's going to start to, that should be a reminder to you. You're going to go around your house and start prepping it and uh, be ready to leave if you have to. 
Um, so if you have neighbors, you want to let them know, um, people that might not be as in tune with the weather as you are. And uh, if it's hot and dry, you're going to close all doors and windows, bring combustibles from the outside in, furniture, umbrellas, stuff like that, and back your car into the driveway, and you'll have that, those important documents ready to go. So go, act early. Um, by leaving early, you give yourself the best chance of survival, and you also give your home the best chance of survival because you're giving the fire department room to come in and, and do their job. And um, when we're talking about wildfires, there's not much that you're going to help by staying there and uh, trying to put the fire out. So you're going to have prepped. If you, if you see smoke, if you start to hear sirens, you should be looking outside. Helicopters, that's a sign. Load those documents up to the car, hit that evacuation route, and and get going. So you want to self-evacuate because it could happen so fast. We've got a lot of ways to notify you of, of a fire, but uh, in this instance, you want to really be paying attention. If you start to hear those things, you want to get out. So defensible space, if you do live in those areas, um, defensible space is the space between a structure and the wildland area that um, it creates kind of a buffer to slow or halt the spread of the fire to the structure. It's going to protect your home from igniting due to direct flame or radiant heat, but it's also going to help with those embers that are cast from uh, far away. So you can create a defensible space by removing weeds, brush, and other vegetation from around your property. We break that into three zones. So the first zone, from zero to five feet around your home, you want to use hard surfaces such as concrete or non-combustible rock mulch around the home. You want to make sure that you clean your roofs and gutters of dead leaves, debris, uh, pine needles. Store firewood and other combustibles away from your home, garage, or attached deck. You want to trim back touching or overhanging branches from the roof to a distance of at least 10 feet. And you want to replace or repair any loose or missing shingles or roof tiles to prevent uh, ember penetration. So from 5 to 30 feet, you want to use non-wood. Low-growing herbaceous vegetation, succulent plants, and ground covers are good choices. Uh, when you do this, you want to create groups so they're not all touching each other, little islands of plants, so there's that separation. So it breaks up the continuous fuels around your home. You want to remove ladder fuels to create a separation between low-level vegetation and tree branches. So the trees that come down, you don't want a bush growing up. You want some clearance there. Keep that fire from climbing the trees. And uh, remove leaf and needle debris from the yard. You want to keep grass and wildfires, wildflowers, excuse me. We want to keep the wildfires out of there, so we'll keep the wildflowers <laughs> under four inches in height. And then if you have any sheds or uh, vehicles back there, you want to have that same space around them. Um, so these are all things that you should be thinking about and doing right now if you live in those zones or within a mile of those zones. Um, you don't want to wait until a wind event comes. So a couple examples that I have. This, is, uh, this isn't in Culver City, thank goodness. This was up on the Mendocino Complex fire. But I, I put this slide in to give you an example of that defensible space. So you've, you've got some brush and trees burning there. But because there's space cleared, it gives the firefighters a chance to work, and it holds the fires there. To the right of this slide, there's, there's homes there. And, and they were saved because of that defensible space. So that, that makes all the difference and, and saves homes. So this one's a little hard to see. Uh, we have a. A helicopter doing a water drop, so you just see the bucket there. The reason I chose this slide, um, this is the same fire, different day. If you look kind of in between the gaps there, you can see uh, some fire. So this, this was a home that had uh, lots of leaves, high dead grass, uh, needles, and trees. They had a lot of clutter around the home. They didn't have good clearance or defensible space. and uh, 
some embers blew in and uh, the house burned to the foundation and there was nothing the firefighters could do. Um, whereas if you look at the blue house, they had a lot better clearance. Uh, they had those leaves cleared. It was, it was, uh, they'd, they'd created that defensible space and so that house was still, still remained and it was safe. So um, it's really important to, to maintain that. And that's all I have. Please look through this. There's, lot, there's lots more details in here, but, but keep in mind, if it happens here, it's going to happen fast. So you have to be ready now and, and be ready to go when it does. Just uh, for curiosity, does anybody here live in Blair Hills or Culver Crest? Where, where every year we inspect uh, those properties where the <laughs> bushes and trees abut up against in the neighborhoods. And um, starting this year, we're going to pay much more attention to that. Not just inspect the areas, but we're going to start doing it parcel by parcel and, and documenting it that way. So we're, we're kind of cranking up the... Um, pre-fire season scrutiny in those areas and that's a good thing but if you live up there we might be a little bit of a pain in the neck because we're gonna we're gonna make you take care of some brush or whatever needs to get taken care of one thing we didn't mention um, well Ken Powell is also a very humble guy as he talked about mutual aid and the strike teams that we go on uh, the your your firefighters get a lot of experience on wildland fires. We deploy year round now and our deployments aren't for a couple of days like they used to be. It's for 14 days, 21 days straight. And our firefighters are often thrown in there in those initial crazy first day or two phase where, um, and it's, my point is, your Culver City firefighters are, you have many veterans of these types of fires because of our strike team deployment. And that's a good thing. So, why did I jump up here again? I want to talk about messaging. This is an issue for every single disaster. I want to describe to you what we have available to us and the limitations of, that they have. And I want to put back on you that communication is a two-way street. We're going to do everything we can if we have to message you about a problem. We're going to do everything we can to reach 100% of the people in that area to notify them that they need to evacuate or shelter in place or whatever they need to do. But it also takes effort on your part to make that happen. I can't hit 100%, but that's our goal. But you also need to be paying attention. right? You also need to be enrolled in some of these things we're going to talk about now. First and foremost, uh, how many of you have heard of Nixel? Now it's called Everbridge. It's the same similar uh, product. It was bought by another company. They offer a lot more neat features that we like. We like that it's evolving. But Everbridge, make sure that you're enrolled in this system. It's, it can text you, email you, phone call you, or whatever. And it's one of our first go-tos for messaging our community. So. Enroll, and we're gonna, we're gonna walk you through that a little bit later. Christine's gonna do the next section where we get into the nuts and bolts of your preparedness for any type of disaster. That's what's gonna happen after I sit down. So one, Everbridge. Two, there's something called wireless emergency alerts. Have you ever been sitting in a meeting or at home when your phone makes a terrible noise and you see an Amber Alert? That's a wireless emergency alert. It's part of, IPAWS, Integrated Public Alert Wireless System. We do have access to this through Everbridge, correct? And so um, uh, technologies are evolving, our capabilities are growing, and we, ha we actually have that capability to use wireless emergency alerts should the, the situation dictate. How many of you have heard of the emergency alert system? You're sitting in front of cable TV and there goes the scroller across it or it makes a noise. That's different. It's a different system. We also have access to this. 
Not directly, but we have access to use that. AM radio, 1690. We have the ability to make a recording, put it on the radio, and if you turn to that frequency, you get instructions there. Right now, I think it's just, hey, this is a, I don't know what the message is right now. It's in a loop saying, hey, this is an emergency radio, turn here if there's a problem. So AM radio, and then of course, social media. So uh, we'll put things out through social media as well. It's a patchwork. You can defeat some of this because there's a feature on your phone where you can turn off your wireless emergency alerts. And so when people get bugged, they do that. Well, that's not a good idea. So we're going to make every effort to message you when we, there's a problem. We're going to use all the tools available to us, but also pay attention to what's going on. If there's smoke in the neighborhood, if there's sirens, be alert. Turn on the news, right? See if there's something on, on uh, uh, one of the social media uh, uh, pages or whatever. I had another thought, and I think I, I just lost it. <laughs> anyway, we're going to do our best to message you. By the way, I remembered what I was going to say. <laughs> Suppose we have to evacuate a neighborhood. We're going to use all of these tools, right? But you will also have firefighters and police officers in those neighborhoods going door to door to make sure those things have happened. So we will also have people working on evacuation, not just technology. Okay. Right. And guess who's up next again? So that actually was a really great segue because let's say we come knocking on your door at 2 o'clock in the morning. Are you ready to go? Do you have a grab and go kit? Just like, oh crap, I got to go. You know, and so that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. And everything I, you're going to see up here and everything I say are contained within the handouts that are over there. So no need to memorize and take copious notes. It's all there. And you can also find it on our city webpage. Um, let me know if I talk too fast because I tend to do that because I get really excited um, talking about this stuff. So let's talk about why is it important to be prepared? So I think one of the most important reasons it's important to be prepared, it just allows you to make more rational decisions in times of high stress. And I think that that's the number one thing. If you've practiced, you know, you put together a plan, you work with your family on, you know, what to do, it's going to help you do that. And so what happens if you are not prepared? You know, disasters happen quickly. They can happen without warning. They can force you to, you know, to evacuate, or they can confine you to your home. They can cut off basic services like water, gas, and power. Have you ever turned off or not used those services one weekend, Friday to Sunday, just to figure it out and see what it feels like? It's like camping at home, because then you realize, oh, wait a minute, I can't use that bathroom, because I can't flush the toilet, because I don't have water. So if, I'm st if my house is still standing and I can stay here, well, how am I going to take care of that, right? And so it gives you an opportunity to really think about, like, okay, what can I do or what do I need to do in order to prepare or be able to stay here if I don't have those resources? There also is, you know, another, you know, significant thing. Uh, emergency relief, there may be a delay in them getting to you. So I know nowadays, you know, we're all so busy and, you know, there's new neighbors moving in and there's often a lot of time where we don't get to talk to one another or get to know one another. You know, I make it a point. I'm like, hi, I'm Christy, you know, and I notice that, you know, a lot of the neighbors are like, oh yeah, I'm like, no, no, wait a minute, I want to talk to you a little bit. You know, we've got a group plan here, you know, this is what we're doing and these are the resources and what do you do for a living? Because imagine, you know, when that 7.4 hits, you know, Culver City, let's say, and you call, you're calling 911 because you need some help um, and you can't get through. Well, what if that lady that lives across the street is a retired nurse? Guess what? I'm going to her house. Or what if that guy next door is a plumber and I can smell gas in my house? I'm going to go to my neighbor plumber. So there's all these really great, you know, networking opportunities within your own community to help you. So, so let's talk a little bit about that and why it's important. At the end of the day, the more resilient you are, the better it is that you're going to be able to survive a disaster. So going to steps. So 
So there are four main steps to being prepared. It's making a plan, having a kit, staying informed, which you know the chief spoke about briefly, and getting involved. So let's take each one and look at it briefly. Making a plan. So put together a plan by discussing these five questions with your family, your friends, or your household. If you live alone, well, guess who your family's going to be? It's going to be your next door neighbors. So as you're putting together your family disaster plan, think about them and talk to them about those planning efforts. Have them either include you or you include them. Next door uh, to me, I have you know a, a senior that lives alone. She's included my plans. You know, I talk to her kids, we've got a whole plan in place to be able to take care of one another. So if you live alone, take a look at your neighbors and people that you can buddy up with when you're doing this process of making your plan. So steps, let's go through the steps. One, how will I receive emergency alerts and warnings? Again, that's number one. How are you gonna get information from us and how are you gonna get us information? There's a lot of different ways. We spoke about Everbridge, we spoke about social media, we spoke about our city website is actually another really great resource for you um, to get information because we'll try to keep it updated as much as we possibly can. So know where to go to get information. That's number one and document that as part of your plan. Two, what is my shelter plan? So like the chief said, what happens if there is a spill? outside and the atmosphere has been compromised, you have to shelter in place. So does anyone know how to shelter in place? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> yeah, our certain members are all raising their hands. Thank you. So sheltering in place essentially is choosing a room that doesn't have a lot of windows, doesn't have a lot of vents, and where you have the ability to kind of close up the room, tape up windows, tape up vents, have a kit in there and just and a radio or a means of being able to get information and stay in place until you're able to clear. So that's what sheltering in place is. So think about that, where that room is gonna be, and write that in your plan. Step three, what is my evacuation route? You know, most of us, when we go home, we leave home, we leave the same exact way. You know, for those of us that lived in Culver City for 40 years, we know probably every route in Culver City, but for those of you that are new to our beautiful city, check it out, drive around, kind of determine what your different routes are gonna be. You should have at least two routes out of your home and to your home, okay? So that's what an evacuation route is. And again, I'm giving you like the high overview, more detailed information is in, is in the handouts. Your fourth thing is, what is your family household communication plan? And this is really huge because one of the questions I like to ask you, do you know how to get a hold of family members at 9 a.m., at 2 p.m., 4 p.m.? You know, you don't know where people are out throughout the day. Is there, do you have different ways to communicate with one another? Is it gonna be through social media? Is it gonna be through WhatsApp? Is it going to be a text thread? Um, they say that when um, communications are down, we may have the ability to still send text messages out. So having that already in place is really huge. Um, the other thing too is having an out-of-state contact. Does everyone know how that works? No, an out-of-state contact. So what, if you, what you do is you choose someone that lives out-of-state. So mine is in Virginia, my Aunt Mollet. So Aunt Mollet, you're gonna be our entire family's out-of-state contact. And what that means is each one of us have your phone number in our wallets and in our cell phones, right? Just in case the cell phone died. Once, if a disaster were to strike Culver City, once we are okay and in a secure location, we're gonna call you and then you need to write down where we are, how we're doing, and then that person, Aunt Molly, will be able to say, hey, I spoke to your dad, he's here. I spoke to your mom, she's here, you know. So that one person is gonna have information for all your family members. So when you're putting together your household disaster plan, you all share that number, and that's how that works. And again, that information's in the handout. And then five, does anyone in my household have specific and or special needs? So it could be mobility, it could be hearing, it could be I have acute asthma, so I have to have inhalers and nebulizers everywhere so that to make sure that something does happen, um, I have the ability to have my medications. So that's very important to write down in your plan. Special needs could also be children, babies, they need formal
morning on, they need diapers, they need, you know, do you, so all those kind of things, even though you may think about it, write it in your plan. Have that all written in your plan, because again, remember, high stress, high stress when something happens, and things that may come naturally on a daily level, you may forget about it. If you have it written in your plan, then you'll have a really good, easy reference, and it'll kind of help to bring down um, the stress a little bit. Another question that you need to ask yourself when you're putting together your plan, we talked about special needs. School information and emergency planning. Before I started doing any of this, I never thought to ask my child's home daycare, it was a home daycare, what's your plan? Where are you gonna take my kid? And I, when I did that, she opened up the door and behind her, there was a big map and with notes and things. I'm like, you never showed this to me, this is great. So I mean, obviously, you know, I was secured. But those are types of questions. Ask your schools, ask your home daycares. If you have parents in assisted living facilities, you ask them for their plans and their contacts, and you include all that in your plans. How many of you guys have pets? Right? So I have a puppy and I have a senior. Different needs, but still, you know, part of my household family. So when you're writing your plans, you make sure that you take into account what their special needs are and making sure that you have enough supplies or that they're written and included in your plan. Once you've answered all these questions, you have now created your plan. A template also is available at our city website if you wanted to download that as well. So let's move on to KIT. Now this tends to be a little bit of an overwhelming subject for people because you're like, how many kids do I need? Where should I put them? What should I do with them? It's completely up to you and how in your lifestyle and what your needs are. These are different types of kits. You know, there's that shelter in place home kit. Well, in that kit, I would probably have some duct tape. I would have some tarps. I would have some plastic. You know, for me, I'm gonna have to have some masks or maybe bandanas, radio. So that's what a kind of a shelter in home place kit. A personal emergency kit or a grab and go, go kit, that's those essentials that you're gonna need to just to be able to run out the door and be able to function for the next three days. And one very important key that one of our CERT members in the back here, Stephanie, um, told me, I always, when I prepared my emergency kits, you know, you dig in your drawers and you're pulling out those old pants that you don't wear and those sweats that you don't wear anymore and you put in emergency kits. The last thing you want to do is be uncomfortable or not feel good about yourself in a disaster when you're, you know, have to start pulling stuff out of your kit. So, with that being said, throw something in there that you like and that makes you feel good in your personal emergency kit. And again, I'm kind of more detailed kits and notes and checklists are in your handouts. There's also the under the bed kit. So those of us that need glasses to function, um, you know, it's a shoe. That's, you know, it's a closed toe shoe. It's tied to your bed. It could be in a bag um, with laces. It has your flashlight in it. It's got your glasses in it. And the reason why we tie it, obviously, if there's a seismic or an earthquake, it starts shaking, you don't want it to go underneath your bed, and then you can't get it, right? So you want to be able to have easily access it. So that's what an under the bed kit is. And then a car kit, well, you know, we live in California, Southern California. We have to drive to get anywhere. So the chances of you being away from home when a big earthquake happens or when something happens, it's pretty big. So I highly recommend having a car kit. If you take anything away here, a car kit. Have some food, have some water, have some respiratory protection. You know, some of the main injuries after like an earthquake are respiratory and glass, pretty much. And so having the ability to protect your eyes, your respiratory, closed toe shoes, right? Because chances are you may have to walk home from wherever you are because you not, you know, you may not be able to drive. So having all that in something that you can carry on your back or wheel through would be very helpful. And if you have children, you know, I've got three, I have enough for all of us because I always have a lot of people in my cars. So I have enough gear for everybody. Kids like the bandanas, I got lots of bandanas to cover the faces and respiratory, but Car kit is mine, really, number one. But I have big kits, I have water, you know, drums, and water's huge too. Um, but anyhow, so these are just different ways that you can have disaster kits. And then step three is staying informed. Can you, are you guys getting the hint of this message here? You know, it's knowing how to get information, right? 
And so we talked about Everbridge, it's a great system. Um, you can sign up by going to our city website, or you can text your zip code to 888-777-AM1690. We we'll talked about the radio, channel 35, our local cable station, and all this is in your notes as well. You're able to, we'll be able to put a cable caller on that. Nextdoor.com, nextdoor.com is huge. That's part of your neighborhood network, and a lot of information um, can be shared and obtained through nextdoor.com. So if you haven't signed up to find out about your neighborhood, highly recommend Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. With technology, there's also a lot of other ways and tools available to us. And I think from these are just a bunch of different ones, but some of the ones that I really like are the first aid ones because I've been at the park and my kid has been stung by a bee and I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot, like, what's the best way to take this thing out? I'll open it up, oh yeah, yeah, don't pinch it, use a credit card, so forth and so on. So having some type of first aid app is really huge and they're free. So these are different ways. Having a quake warning app, those are fantastic too. You can set it you know, to whatever degree of warning you want, if it's a 4.0 or 3.0, but these are a bunch of different apps. Um, to be able to obtain information, to stay informed. Red Cross, I love Red Cross's apps. They have the first aid, they have the emergency, they have, for, I mean, they have a really a lot of great information. Pets, they have a really great pet app um, as well. And youth, so my kids can play along with it and learn about being emergency safe without it being threatening or scary, which I think is huge. FEMA, um, has done a really great job too on having information that you can share with your children that again is not threatening and scare, uh, scary. Um, so it's got ready.gov. There's a lot of great kid resources there as well. Uh, get involved. So we talked about our teams, you know, our community emergency response teams, fantastic. Every year we do a citywide disaster drill. Do you guys know about our citywide disaster drill? Awesome. So. Every year, as a city, we practice our internal plans. We do the canvassing of the neighborhoods. We'll, you know, sometimes we'll open up our emergency operations center. But most importantly, our CERT teams, they, we activate them. And they essentially will set up somewhere within the city to the, into the command posts. And we have injects of ways that they can go out and pretend like they're going to go and save people and bring them back and uh, you know, practice their first aid and practice using our radios. It's a really, really great exercise that we do uh, third Thursday in October, so that's a fun way. Talked about our seat carriers, and then we talked about neighborhood networks. And again, that's why I talked about nextdoor.com, or if your community where you live, you have a neighborhood um, watch association, get involved. Um, I've been really active with a bunch of uh, neighborhood watch groups here, like Culver Crest, Lindbergh Park, Rain Tree. They're doing a lot of really, really great things. And so anytime that you have um, an event or that you want us to be there to talk about it, feel free to contact us because we're there to, to share some information. And I think that's it. So, a <clears throat> couple of closing thoughts. We all have very busy lives, uh, but it's important to take the time to prepare. At the end of the day, emergency preparedness, it starts and ends with what you're actually choosing to do. We gotta take the time to do these things. Yeah, you, know, you, your family, your neighborhood, their well-being, it, it's important that you, you make effort now towards preparedness. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Make plans and prepare. I think you have some roadmaps or some templates you could use to do that. Get involved. If you're not a CERT member, I recommend the CERT training. If you like radios, I recommend <laughs> C-CARES. And this is Culver City. There are so many ways to get involved. We have a, such a fantastic city. And stay aware of what's happening. Pay attention. You know, it'll give you some time to do things if you need to do things versus being surprised by something. So this concludes our presentation. Uh, what we can do now is field any questions you might have. So if you, 
If you, if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, we're all going to go sit at the table. Raise your hand. Tell which, who do you want to ask a question of and ask away and we'll answer your questions. I guess this is going to uh, perhaps Christine. If I am enrolled in the Nixle program, am I automatically enrolled in the Everbridge program, or do I need to re-enroll? See so if you can hear me. Um, that's a great question, Marty. Uh, you do not need to re-enroll. We have the, all the information, all the contacts from the Nixle, and are able to send out information. With that being said, however. Since there is, since Everbridge is a more robust system, if you would like to add additional contacts and information, then I do recommend that you sign up with Everbridge because it'll give you the opportunity to add more ways for us to get in contact with you in an emergency. Um, Miss Christine, um, do you need to write down like your plan, your emergency plan? Do you need to like, write it down for yourself? Hi, Skylar. Um, yes, you do. You do need to write down an emergency plan. And the handouts that I gave you have a little bit of a template. But if you go to our city website, which you can find on those handouts, there actually is an editable, if you will, um, template where you can punch in or you know type in the information of your plan, create your plan, and you can save it as a document on your computer. So every year, when you review your plan, right, because we review it every year, um, then you can just take a look at it and, you know, update it there and reprint it out again. Um, this is for the fire chief. Um, how far can fire spread? Can you repeat that? Um, how far can fire spread? As long as you got fuel and wind, it can go and until it runs out. So fires, think of our brush fires. They're huge. You know, uh, hundreds and, and even thousands of square miles. Fires can be big. Hi, I'm, I'm a little confused about Culver City's northern boundary and Venice Boulevard. Um, how does that work with Los Angeles? That's a very interesting question. Have you ever seen our boundaries? <laughs> it's like a jigsaw puzzle on Venice. So it really depends where you're at. Are you asking because you're concerned about if you live on a border, on the border, if you're going to get emergency services or not, who you're going to get? Or Yeah, um, so in any jurisdiction at the boundary, it could create some issues if you're dialing 911 because if you're on your cell phone, where are you if, the, if you're right near a boundary? I'm telling you, that's not a concern here because Culver City, Los Angeles City, and LA County all have the same operating procedure that if we get a call on the border, we're not gonna spend time figuring out who it is. We're just gonna go, and we'll, later on we'll figure out if it's actually LA cities or LA counties or whatnot, and we'll call them. But the important thing is the first call to dispatch they'll send units to take care of you, regardless of the border. So we routinely we routinely cross the borders by a block or so with people thinking they're in Culver City. And the other jurisdiction that's actually in, it's usually LA City, we call them immediately and turn the call over to them once they get there. Does that make sense? Just a brief follow-up to what you just said. I hope the post office learns where we live someday. <laughs> uh, this question is directed to all of you. Uh, I'm a CERT member and have done um, uh, neighborhood watch uh, meetings, organized them, and uh, emergency preparedness meetings, too. Um, what concerns me the most is that I feel like that I'm pretty prepared, and maybe some of my neighbors are too, but most of them are not. And what am I gonna do when 
my family's okay, and there are 10 other families coming to me to help them, and I do not have the resources to do that. Um, that is a fantastic question, and that's what I struggle with because I am like you. I'm, I'm prepared. I've got it all dialed in. Everyone knows in my neighborhood that I've dialed in. But so my job, I'm, I'm preaching. I am going to everybody that will take a moment to listen to me and just, just remind me that if you want to do anything, it's overwhelming. I mean, I know we gave you a lot of information. And putting together a plan, putting together a kit, you know, taking the time to create a shopping list to go purchase all these items that you need. It takes a lot of time and it can overwhelm people. But what I tell people, if you do anything today, get water. Get water. Because the last thing that you want to do, you can live without food, but you can't live without water. And the last thing that you want to do is to be waiting in a line with 500 of your neighbors with a bucket and not knowing if you get to the front of that line whether well, there's going to be any more water. So let's start small. Buy water. And you know, and scare them. I'm scare them. Tell them. <laughs> you need water. And so I mean, I think that it's, it's just important and it's upon us. Shame on us. You know, one of the things that I also like to tell people, and I start off my conversations, because I call them conversations when I do my presentations. I'm like, what's the most important things in your life? So let me ask you guys. What's the most important things in your life? People. People, right? Your family. What are things that you save for? Your home. What is you? College, retirement. Okay, so you've done those things, right, to secure your future. What have you done to protect your family? Okay, well, you just told me it's the most important thing, and you've done nothing to protect them? It's okay. You're not the only one. Let's do it. And that's... That's, what I, that's how I try to approach it. Well, what do you say the, to them the night of the emergency? <laughs> the, I'm sorry, the night of the emergency? But like, this is, I can't touch it. No, I mean, you, know, you, do, you, only, you can only do what you can do. Yeah. But that was a great question. You know, and I think, too, what we're doing tonight is a move forward to help with that. I mean, the more we can get the word out, mm -hmm. the more we can advertise it, you know, get it on the city website, have these types of presentations. You know, those people that don't believe in it, the more they hear it, maybe it will start to make sense to them. Yeah. So. Question, when and where is CERT training given? <coughs> you can ask some of, oh, Chief. Chief oh, so it's provided um, a couple of times a year, two to three times a year. The training is conducted on Jefferson Boulevard at the fire department training uh, facility. If you didn't know, we have a training yard on Jefferson, 9275 Jefferson. And when's our next CERT class? Battalion Chief Rob Kolob, do you know? Yes, it's in October. It's in October. We must just have one then. Yeah, we just had one and then in June there's going to be a refresher, so you can go to the Thank you, Chief Colo. June 8th is the next refresher. June 8th. The refresher <laughs> is different. Refresher one day thing? Yes, sir. First of all, I want to say thank you. Our neighborhood organized, and Christine Parr was over the top, and she's always ready to help. In fact, one of my neighbors, who's literally a rocket scientist and into the asteroids, has been in communication with the college and the fire department to do another emergency of disaster preparedness because we want to reach out to the whole city because it is so valuable. We got together, Christine reminded us that uh, first of all, emergency readiness is not two or three days. If I recall, you said every freeway uh, in the county is on an earthquake line except for the 101. So imagine all the transportation on that. So we need to be ready for at least seven days. What I've done with neighbors, the majority got right on board. It was amazing. People rarely talk to, we're all talking to each other, helping each other get our plans together, etc. because it's easier to do it as a group than to try to do it all on your own. Uh, 
And there were a few people, oh, you know, I'm fine, I'm fine. I said, yes, you are, but don't come knocking at our doors. You know, because we did the triage for the children, for the medical, for the whole nine yards. Also, I don't care how old you are, take the CERT course, you'll be grateful. And thank you, you're the most awesome fire people. Thank you. I have a question on the 911 system. Sometimes when a person calls in, they don't give complete information. For both landlines and for cell uh, phones, do you have the ability to know it, uh, immediately where the or origin of the telephone uh, is? Do you, know, do you know where it is? Uh, yes and no. It depends on how you're calling dispatch. And you may or may not be aware that Culver City joined a regional dispatch center approximately two years, year and a half, two years ago. We did that for a variety of reasons, um, but most importantly, um, they're a regional center. The way they're staffed, their technology, um, it, it, it was a very, very good move, and in the two years since we joined, I've been more and more impressed with them. Um, if you dial a landline, it pops up on the screen and they know that immediately. Uh, with a cell phone, it, ends, it depends on a lot of things, on how accurate that location is. The uh, age and model of your phone, who your provider is, stuff like that. On a cell phone, you might have to get more information than you would on a landline. But that technology is rapidly um, evolving. And most dispatch agencies, including the one that we're affiliated with, are implementing technology in the next couple months that should improve that so it, you can, when you use a cell phone, it pops up just as accurately or close to your landline. Does that make sense? Did you know, you know, when we're talking about 911 on the cell phone, did you know who answers that when you dial 911 on the cell phone? It depends on where you are. Because who is your cell provider? What cell tower are you affiliated with? And where is that pointed? So you might get, it might, if you're deep into Culver City, it's going to be um, our dispatch that picks it up. But you're, if you're on the border, it could be LA City, it could be CHP, it might be us, it depends. And we'll, they'll transfer as quickly as they can to the right center. And as I spoke about just a minute ago, if it's Culver City, Culver City answering a call that's actually in LA, we're not gonna squabble over that or we're gonna send people and then we'll call LA City and tell them, hey, we have a call. And they do that in reverse. So it should bring you some comfort. What? Also, one other thing, as Chief mentioned with our current dispatch center, they are uh, implementing new technology, some of which will start this June and it's called a Rapid SOS. <laughs> which will basically, if you dial 911 from a cell phone, it'll pinpoint exactly where you are. So if I were to dial 911 on my cell phone, it wouldn't only tell me the address, but it would point me in this room. So that, like the chief mentioned, there's a lot of technology out there, and our current dispatch is they're staying on top of it. So, so I have a couple of questions for the chief. Um, one, one is. Uh, how will, how will uh, you take part in our general plan update, in planning uh, you know, how all these things are gonna work for the next coming decade? That's, that's one question. And then another question that I hear a lot that's, pretty, that's kind of related is when you see all this development that's coming on in Culver City and all this construction that's happening, how are we expanding our uh, services to be able to service all the new people that are coming in the new businesses that Thank you, Mr. Small. I'll, take, I'll, I'll talk about, I'll answer the second question first. You know, I, I referenced that we, we do almost 7,000 calls a year. That's a big change from just a few years ago. I think in the time that I've been fire chief, and I've been chief now almost five years, our call volume has gone up about, I want to say about 40%, which is, which is a big increase. 
your, your fire department has been, if I do say so myself, magnificent at adapting to this increased call volume. There's a lot of work that goes with it. It's not just the calls, it's the training and preparation, it's the restocking and cleaning and preparation and readiness after the call. There's a lot that goes on with increased call volume. But we've kept this issue in front of the city council for the last few years. This isn't a surprise. We've seen this increase. And the city council is supporting us to apply for a grant, and that grant's already been submitted, that we will add a third paramedic unit to our, our employment model based out of Station 2. So if things go well with the grant, probably by uh, January, maybe February, there'll be a third paramedic rescue. That's what we need the most. That's the resource we need. When we talk about our call volume going up, paramedic transport capability, and the council has been fantastically supportive of that. So that, that was your second question. Your first question, the reason I put it off is I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to answer that, <laughs> but oh, what we can do to participate in the, in contributing to the general plan and the evolution of what's happening there, I'm not exactly sure. Um, one thing we did as part of our accreditation process is we did a deep dive into different parts of the city is what we call our community risk assessment. We try to quantify fire risk and non-fire risk in different parts of the city and really drill down. I wish I had an example of it I could show you. I didn't bring one. But the city is divided into um, 15 different fire management zones, that's for analysis purposes. And in each one of those little chunks, I know how many single family dwellings, I know how many duplexes, how many commercial buildings, how many square feet, what percentage of that is sprinklered, uh, where are the hazardous materials stored and used, where are the families that um, uh, don't speak English, where are the family, how many of those families in that zone are disabled. So I think we might be able to leverage all this work we did for a community risk assessment. I think we might be able to leverage that and use that as we apply, as we move forward working with the general plan. Can I kind of, oh, wow, that's really, really loud. Um, I can add on to that, because I know where you work. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be really critical that we get uh, your input early on um, as we're reaching out um, about how to craft the policies and the safety element and the climate adaptation plan. So it'll be using all of the efforts that you've already done and just bringing those up 30,000 foot to the policy level and making sure that it's all consistent in the purview. Hello, thank you so much for this uh, outstanding presentation. Just as an FYI, the last time that the safety element of the general plan was updated was 1968. Oh so um, obviously our department, you can see, is incredibly prepared and so they haven't waited for the city council to make this move, obviously. Um, but, but it will be really important for us to look at this as a policy level as Ashley mentioned, a climate action plan because we know our weather is evolving and not necessarily in a positive way and we need to be uh, prepared for that and resilient as a community. But I did have a question. Um, we, and it's kind of a, a difficult one because uh, we, we talked a lot about uh, natural disasters, um, but increasingly, uh, distressingly, we're seeing human-caused disasters, um, active shooters, um, things of that nature. It's, it's hard to prepare the community for these things, but I'm, I'm wondering um, if you could share how the department is, is training and working on these uh, scenarios. Um, and then just one kind of recent tidbit and, and I think that would be interesting for the public to know is that in, in the case where you cannot safely make that call to 911, you can now text. So that's gonna be an important tool if, if and hopefully none of us will be in this situation, but um, if need be. Yeah, 
man-made problems. Loyal Bill Floyd, is it different today than it was when I joined Culver City Fire Department about 31 years ago? Um, our equipment, we have ballistic vests, we have ballistic helmets, we have ballistic glasses, and during active shooter events, we form up with the PD to form extraction teams to go into the dangerous areas and pull people out. We train, we've done the training a lot. The police and the fire are, are very close here in Culver City. We work very, very well together. But, but um, Mayor, there's so much more that we're, I never dreamed that we would stockpile chem chemical weapon antidotes. antidotes. We do. Yeah, um, antibiotics. Uh, so whether we're talking a uh, lone wolf, uh, mentally deranged person who you know, starts shooting at a supermarket, or are we talking terrorists or whatnot, your, your fire department is very prepared. Um, the emphasis on terrorism has really um, even predates um, September 11th. So for the fire service, the wake-up call for terrorism was the World Trade Center in 1993, not 2001. And you have many firefighters who have special training. I already talked about the special equipment we have. We have a great working relationship with the police department, and that's crucial in the event of these type of incidents. We, we have to work on the same page and work together side by side to, to take care of some of these types of instances. And, and we do a good job of that. I'm very proud of where we're at with our um, preparation to handle violence. the fire department or the city council as in regard to how, how high is the earthquake risk to Culver City in regards to trying to decide whether or not retrofitting, let's say a single family residence, is more effective than just buying earthquake insurance with a high deductible. And uh, we get reminded of this question every time we're Home insurance comes up for renewal every, you know, and and there's some kind of scare ads on television saying, "Are you going to risk the value of your equity in the home if you don't get earthquake insurance or retrofitting? Uh, is there any aid in regards to retrofitting? And does the city have a position on what to do in this case?" Thank you. Well. I can't emphasize enough the importance uh, to acknowledge that another earthquake is going to happen, whether it's a six or a seven or an eight. I don't know, but we're in California, we're part of the Pacific Rim. It's just what the it's the geology of where we live. So, are we going to have another earthquake? Absolutely, yes, we will. And the longer we go from the last one, the closer we are to the next one. I don't know when, but. But it's coming. Um, as far as assistance, if, I, if it was my home, if my home is bolted the foundation and retrofitted, um, and so I, if you have the means to do that, I highly recommend it. And as far as assistance, you know, like maybe financial assistance for that, I'm not aware of anything that's that is available to you to help you with that. But we will, we will have another earthquake tomorrow or. Ten years from now, I don't know, but it's going to happen. I, my questions pertain to earthquakes as well. Um, what is the current prescribed method for what to do in an earthquake? It used to be like get in a doorway, then it was crouch near a sturdy piece of furniture and create a triangle of space. But then I hear that that's not what you should be doing. I honestly really don't know anymore what what you're supposed to do. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. It's a really great question. So um, today, <laughs> so let's talk about today. So today they say do not go in a doorway if it has a door, because if there's a violent shaking, for obvious reasons, you don't want to go in a doorway. If there is a door with no doors, that is a potential if you don't have a sturdy piece of furniture that you can take cover underneath on and hold on. Um, the triangle of life, 
Um, we do not recommend that here in California because of the we have very stringent building standards here. And so our building construction is meant to be able to withstand a significant um, earthquake. The Triangle of Life was something, a method that was taught in other countries where um, the building standards were not as astringent and just a, another way of being able to hold on. So the bottom line is under a table, obviously not a glass table, but um, under a table, you know, under a desk, something sturdy. If it were to happen in the middle of the night when you're asleep, you stay in your bed, you take cover, try to cover your head, and you stay there until the shaking has stopped, and then you get up and you activate your family disaster plan. I live in a condo building that has three floors and an underground garage. Do I get out of there immediately because I'm in a middle floor? <laughs> or you know, do we stay and hope think something like Northridge doesn't happen, which you know, a lot of those buildings right. came down? So, um, another great question. Um, so what I recommend is you stay until the shaking stops. You know, you evacuate to your meeting place. And then from outside, you know, the layperson should be able to look at the building to determine whether or not it's still structurally sound. And if it still looks structurally sound, well, then I, I would stay in it. But if not, then I would not. So when you evacuate, make sure you grab your backpack, your purse, whatever it may be, when you evacuate out. Um, also keeping in mind, though, that when there is one, a big one, there may be aftershocks. So you just have to be aware that there is that potential as well. Um, and uh, that's what I would recommend. So before we move on to our next question, I still see like seven to 10 hands raising every time. We're five minutes over our time, and I promised the Girl Scouts I'd get back to them. So I would just ask if it's a question that can be transferred to staff after, please hold them. Got a burning desire question and bust through it. Very quick here. Um, my husband Charlie and I lived through the quake in 1992. I'm wearing my shirt tonight. And I'm thinking it's important for people to be aware, to be prepared ahead of time for their interior home. Uh, for example, I now put tapestries up over the bed, no more heavy frame pictures. And there are a lot of things like this that might be very helpful to have available for people to think through beforehand. Um, I just wanted to make that as a suggestion. And let me give you a couplet. Our fire department is first rate. Everything they do for us is really great. Three cheers for you and thank you for the presentation. It's not necessarily meant for an earthquake. That is a, a way of protecting yourself if there's something in the air that you can't breathe or there's a reason why you can't go outside. So if there's an earthquake and you <coughs> evacuate and your home is okay, then you can come back into and use your whole home. Does that answer your question? Okay, so I've got one question back here. This gentleman's been waiting in one front and then we probably have to call it quits. But you can definitely follow up after. I, I'm really not a plant, although I have a, a history with certain sea cares in the city for a number of years. Chief Powell talked about evacuations. Just curiosity, because many of us may not know, how fast would a fire grow and expand? Let's see. 
uh, just confirming what kind of fire are we talking about? A structure fire, a wildland fire? Structure. Uh, that would depend on the fuel inside the building, how long it has been burning before we actually arrive on scene or before someone can actually call 911. Um, those are things that we determine when we first arrive on scene. You know, a fire that occurs in the middle of the night tends to have been burning a lot longer than one during the day because people will see it during the day and call early. Um, you know, it really depends on what the structure is made of, you know, the fuel inside the structure. Obviously, if it's a building under construction where there's a lot of open construction, that's gonna tend to burn a lot faster. Um, but like the disaster plan you would have for an earthquake, you should have it an evacuation plan for your house in case of a fire. And the sooner, you know, to help you get out of that house as fast as possible, we obviously recommend that you have fire alarms in every room on every floor. And change those batteries twice a year, you know, at the turn of the uh, daylight savings, put a new battery in your smoke alarm, because they work, they save lives. And once you're out, then you know, if the house burns, it, it is sad, but at least you're still alive. Uh, there is an earthquake bolting retrofit assistance program in the state of California. I'm sorry, I don't know the name of it, but I know it's there. Because every year I check to see if my zip code is on it, and it hasn't been so far. But it's by zip code. Mm -hmm. um. To, to answer to answer or to speak just a little bit to what he said, I'm aware of that and I check it every year too. So as soon as Culver City's on that list, I will be posting it everywhere. Just to let you know. The post office calls me nine zero zero six six. But if you sign up for social media, the fire department, you will see my posting on it. Or nextdoor.com, I'll post it on next door. Let's talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay, I, I just want to say thank you so much to our fire department and the chief and the whole team. This is eye-opening and I almost feel like we need to do this regularly because what an opportunity this is. I'm just sorry I didn't bring my kids. So thank you guys so much and thank all of you for coming tonight. We'll be around if you have some questions to ask us. We'll hang out a little bit. So. Fire, fire, fire Service Day. May 11th. One other thing, everybody. Uh, this week on Saturday is Fire Service Day. Uh, we'll be fire located at Fire Station Number One at 9600 Culver Boulevard. I believe the times are 9 a.m. to 3 p.m.